Hello and welcome to Natural Informant Weekly. I'm Danny Curtin. Thank you for joining me today. Over the last several years, limiting the amount of time you eat during the day to a very specific and typically much smaller window has become very popular. It's called time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. The most popular version of this type of eating is called 16-8 fasting, where you only eat during an eight-hour window and you fast for the other 16 hours of the day. There is a wealth of clinical data on this type of eating showing the causal relationship it has to improvements in body weight, blood pressure, blood glucose, and reduced inflammation levels. Four of arguably the most important factors for reducing your risk of heart and circulatory diseases. However, this month, researchers from Shanghai Zhao Tong University in China presented early findings from their study to the American Heart Association. They say their study links intermittent fasting with doubling the risk of dying from cardiovascular diseases. According to the researchers, people who limited their eating window to less than eight hours a day had a 91% almost double increased risk of dying from heart and circulatory diseases compared to those who had a more typical eating window of 12 to 16 hours. It's important to note that this study is observational, which means it cannot prove cause and effect. It can only show a correlated link between two factors, sort of like shark attacks and ice cream sales. Shark attacks and ice cream sales are correlated to some degree since they both go up in the summer, but obviously one does not cause the other. Unfortunately, the media and other pro-pharma organizations were very quick to misrepresent and gaslight the public. The Daily Mail used the headline, quote, Fasting for 16 or more hours per day raises risk of dying from heart problems by almost double, 20-year analysis finds. And the American Heart Association posted, quote, Eight-hour time-restricted eating linked to a 91% higher risk of cardiovascular death. And USA Today posted, quote, We were surprised. Intermittent fasting flagged as a serious health risk. Frankly, the outcomes of this study, in my opinion, don't deserve any type of analysis. Now, I say this because this is not an intermittent fasting study. This is an observational study that attempts to figure out the eating habits of 20,000 people over an average of eight years. They took two days of data from a survey and attributed that same way of eating for each person for the next, on average, eight years. This is not a joke. They were actually taken seriously by the American Heart Association. Unfortunately, this is just another attempt by pharmaceutical captured healthcare, media, and pro-pharma organizations to put doubt into the minds of people that are trying to stay healthy without medical or pharmaceutical interventions. And speaking of captured organizations, the FDA has lost its battle against ivermectin. If you remember, during the height of the pandemic, many doctors, including those that sued the FDA in this case, began prescribing several drugs off-label in an effort to figure out what would help their sick patients. Ivermectin was one of these drugs. But for the first time in history, doctors that prescribed this medication were met with intense backlash from government organizations, especially the FDA. You may remember their most popular post of all time on Twitter, now X. Quote, you're not a horse, you're not a cow. Seriously, y'all, stop it. The post linked to a page on the FDA's website titled, Why You Shouldn't Use Ivermectin to Prevent or Treat COVID-19. But the plaintiff doctors during the trial made the point that it is not the job of the FDA to practice medicine. It is fine for the FDA to state that a drug has not been approved for a specific use, but it is not within the realm of the agency to advocate against the off-label usage of a drug. 20% of all prescriptions made today are for off-label usage. It is not only legal for doctors to do so, but it is also common as it allows doctors to make the best choices for their individual patient. They went on to say that FDA misled the public on purpose, inferring that ivermectin is only for animals, when in fact it is also formulated for humans. And it's also listed as one of the safest and most essential drugs ever made by the World Health Organization. Regarding the outcome, one of the plaintiffs stated, quote, this landmark case sets an important precedent in limiting 
FDA overreach into the doctor-patient relationship. And when it comes to FDA overreach, Senator Dick Durbin, a.k.a. Little, is trying to give FDA more power to regulate the dietary supplement industry. But health advocates are rallying against the new dietary supplement proposal, which was already defeated once in 2022. But Senator Durbin isn't giving up, so he is reintroducing the legislation. This initiative aligns with the FDA's request for authority to implement a mandatory product listing database, which would put new regulations on dietary supplement companies. The regulations would require them to upload and send every single product label to the FDA. Critics argue that this registry, which is very similar to the Canadian model, would not enhance the safety of dietary supplements, but would only be used to restrict supplement availability. Despite statistics showing no deaths from dietary supplements and a safety record outperforming conventional foods, proponents, including the FDA, claim the list is necessary to identify and eliminate dangerous and illegal products from the market. However, the FDA already has the power to eliminate dangerous products from the market, and when companies add dangerous, illegal ingredients to their products, they are already breaking the law. If these companies were required to list their products in this mandatory product listing database, would they include the illegal ingredients in their listings? I think not. Health advocates believe that Senator Durbin and the FDA are using safety as a smokescreen and that such a registry will be used to target and eliminate products that the agency believes compete with FDA-approved drugs. They contend that such mandatory listings could pave the way for the removal of high-dose supplements, stifle innovation in the sector, and that increased regulations will drive up prices and limit consumer choice, which will ultimately benefit pharmaceutical interests at the expense of natural health options. Currently, a grassroots movement is underway with an urgent call to action for the public to voice their opposition to Congress and safeguard the right to choose dietary supplements freely. If you are a dietary supplement user and you would like to safeguard supplements from Senator Durbin and FDA overreach, you can easily contact your senator and oppose this legislation by clicking the Protect Supplements link in the description below. If you enjoyed this content, please make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel so you never miss a week of the news you need to stay healthy. Again, I'm Danny Curtin. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.